Hi everyone, hope this finds you well um, and enjoying the conference. Glad to be with you here today. Um, my name is Dr. Sil Machado and today I'm going to give a uh, presentation on um, shame and in particular using alchemy as a lens and framework for understanding the healing of shame um, in psychotherapy. Just to briefly introduce myself, I'm an assistant professor of counseling at Sonoma State University. I'm a former core faculty member in the depth psychology program at Sonoma State University and also um, at the clinical in the clinical social work program at the Sandville Institute. In addition to my academic appointment at Sonoma State, um, I have a small private practice in Northern California where I specialize in what I think about as integrative depth psychotherapy as well as neurofeedback, primarily working with um, folks who uh, have survived different forms of trauma, and also I work extensively with the LGBTQ plus community. Just to provide a brief overview, <clears throat> I'm gonna just um, provide some sort of general information regarding shame, what we might think about some theories um, related to shame. And then uh, going to tie together shame, um, kind of looking at shame through this lens of alchemy, through this framework that the metaphorical language of alchemy provides. And as I do that, I'm gonna talk some about a particular case um, for my practice, um, an individual that I worked with over um, a number of years um, who presented um, with a number of different issues that we, over our work together, tied back to shame in his life. I should mention just for myself, um, both as a, um, as in my in my scholarly work as well as in my clinical work, um, I tend to um, I'm, I'm really interested in shame and sort of understanding the interplay of shame with the various issues that clients present with. Um, I work a lot, like I mentioned, with the queer community, but also with trauma survivors, and I found that shame tends to be a very common issue among the folks that I see, um, and uh, because of the way in which trauma um, can generate shame and um, cause the internalization of shame for folks, and certainly the way that negative messages about being queer can pervade, um, you know, it invades someone's sense of themselves and the shame that that then leads to. So I, I want to recognize um, as well that what I'm going to present today, um, I'll, some of it might be familiar to you. And um, this is a model that I've been kind of developing and thinking about for a number of years now. And certainly the field of shame is sort of, I think, um, kind of seeing uh, there's a, I think there's a re resurgence in resurgence in interest in shame and looking at shame, particularly in the trauma literature. Um, and so this might be, you know, literature and information that's familiar to you. And certainly the work around alchemy, it's a, it's of course, I mean, it's a vast, um, it's a vast field when thinking about alchemy and looking at the different kinds of texts from different cultures and practices and procedures from different cultures. So we are just kind of only, only scraping the surface today in this talk. So just a little bit about shame, just like to kind of give us um, a little bit of a context to think about shame as we're talking about it here today. Um, so you're probably aware that shame was identified by Tompkins as one of nine innate affects um, and emotions. Uh, shame, according to Kaufman, um, fits alongside uh, these um, other um, emotions, including interest, enjoyment, surprise, distress or anguish, fear or terror, anger or rage, dismell and disgust, and then shame is the last, shame and humiliation. Um, Tompkins talked about um, shame as a sort of hardwired emotion um, that is built into who we are um, and that it actually you know, sort of serves a purpose. And as Jacoby goes on to say, really one of the purposes that it serves and that we know is that it enforces social norms. Uh, Tompkins talks about shame as the painful feeling of humiliation or distress that is caused by awareness of wrongdoing or foolish behavior. Um, now, 
you know, um, a lot of the literature on shame, like if one reads it, you can get the sense that shame is a really bad thing. And I think that what's important to realize is that typically when we're thinking about the toxic effects of shame, we're thinking about what Kaufman, and I'll mention this in a, in a little bit, refers to as pathogenic shame. But really, as, a, as one of you know, these nine core sort of emotional experiences that we have, shame isn't necessarily a bad thing on its own. It's, it's really, it's an important experience, it's an important emotion that really de- um, guides the development of oneself as a conscientious person. Um, and, you know, when, when evoked, um, a little bit goes a long way and a little bit can have a desired effect to really kind of shape behavior so that one is able to be a part of um, the group, whatever that group is, a part of one's family, a part of a social group, um, and know, you know, kind of the norms of the behavior within that context. Um Jacoby says that shame serves to both to enforce individual and collective boundaries in society by promoting adherence to social norms. I think that's a nice way of putting it. Now, Alan Shore talks some about shame as a neurobiological regulator, and I think this idea is interesting. He um, uh, he explains that shame is something that typically comes on in um, toddlerhood. Um, and that it's intended to sort of at, from an evolutionary perspective is intended to protect the newly mobile child. So being mobile um, as the child moves into toddlerhood is able to walk, um, the child can begin to act in new ways on their impulses. Um, and of course, especially so without a fully developed frontal cortex. And this can be dangerous. Um, you know, I'm assuming that some of you listening here have children or are close to children and know that um that you know, I'm thinking of for myself, I have a daughter who is um, three. Um, she takes all sorts of risks all the time. Um, and, and she takes them, she takes more risks as she's able to become more mobile. And so um, from uh, Alan Shore's perspective, shame acts as a very quick inhibitory force. Um, so and what 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 Shore explains is that, you know, typically, when engaging in interest and activity and sort of engagement with the environment, the toddler is in a state of sympathetic arousal. And um, that the induction of shame by another um, causes the um, causes uh, parasympathetic activity to take over in the nervous system, which can then reduce the child's activity, essentially stopping it, um, to prevent the danger or potential danger that could happen. So there's this way in which, you know, thinking about, you know, from Tompkins' view, you know, these nine innate, you know, core emotions, then from Shore's view, shame is a neurobiological regulator to ensure the safety of the child. Um, we kind of see that there's a way in which there's this kind of evolutionary purpose to shame. And again, we're just talking about shame here, not pathogenic shame. Now, in the work of Kaufman, which is older, but if you're interested in the field of shame, Kaufman is definitely someone to be aware of and whose work I would really recommend reading. Um, this is, you know, uh, so Kaufman really focuses his work on what he calls um, pathogenic shame. And um, pathogenic shame is really the experience where one is shamed um, repeatedly. And, you know, in, in very, very high doses. So going back to what I said earlier, that like, you know, to guide moral behavior, to guide appropriate behavior, a little bit of shame goes a long way. For Kaufman, we're talking about kind of chronically shaming environments where shame becomes internalized and where over time the person comes to, um, parts of their psyche come to shame themselves. And so this is where the voice of the shaming other becomes internalized and the person perpetuates this pattern of shaming this themselves. So this is what kind of the crux of Kaufman's work. So um, Kaufman de- 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 defines shame as um, the severing of the interpersonal bridge. So this is the painful experience of being seen in a diminished manner. And like I said, it is experience. It's an experience that is induced by another person, um, and it's being seen um, in a way where one f- suddenly feels exposed or self-conscious. 
Um, so I can think of a particular client, the image that comes to mind for me when I, as I'm saying this to you right now, is a particular client, not the one that I'll present on later, but another client who, about the age of six or seven, in the kitchen, put on his mom's apron and was sort of dancing around the kitchen in his mom's apron. And this is a young queer kid, um, just sort of in this moment of joy, dancing around the kitchen in his mom's apron, sort of pretending it's a dress. And his um, he's delighting in this experience. And then suddenly his father enters the room with a very disdainful look on his face, a very judgmental look, a very shaming look. And for the client in this moment, he remembers very specifically that suddenly he feels bad. He feels what he's doing is bad, and he feels that he, as a result, is bad to the core. Um, and the message that he is left with from that experience that still is with him today is that there's I'm defective. There's something wrong with me. This idea of there's something wrong with me is such an enduring experience for so many of the clients that we work with. I'm guessing that um, you yourselves, if you're working with clients, have encountered folks who um, hold in this very deep-seated way this belief that there's something terribly wrong with them. Um, and I bring this, for me, when someone is sort of getting into this territory, it really brings me to um, shame and that pathogenic shame is very much a part of the clinical picture. So for Kaufman, this bridge of connection between oneself and another is severed in a shaming moment. Um, and that this experience of disconnection from the other, once internalized over time with repeated encounters of this nature, begins to manifest as um, disconnection from um, aspects of oneself. So for that particular client I just mentioned moments ago, really cutting off over the course of his life from the experience of joy, really cutting off from the experience of delight, and then certainly really cutting off from any kind of experience inside of himself related to um, any form of femininity, which in that moment his father was shaming him for. Um, so there's the severing from the other and then chronically over time when exposed to that sort of shame, severing from aspects of oneself, which will become important when we think about alchemy and the bringing back together of things. So these experiences, according to Kaufman, can happen in, you know, um, you know, in, in, you know, sort of um, some unavoidable, unavoidable moments of misattunement that we can have over the course of our life, um, ranging from that all the way to outright mistreatment, um, you know, things like bullying, abuse, neglect, things of that nature. And again, for Kaufman, it's the internalization of this process that becomes most, most um, that is most um, painful for the individual and that causes the most um, disruption in the person's life. Also, just of note here, just want to say in terms of this idea of interpersonal bridge, that the impact of shame is then mediated by the repair that occurs after the shame has been experienced. So in that situation that I mentioned with this particular client when he's six years old, dancing around his kitchen in his mother's apron, if his father had sort of recognized like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm shaming my son right now. I don't want to do that. I love my son. And then got down onto his son's level and said, my goodness, I'm so sorry I gave you that look. Um, I just was so surprised to see you dancing around the kitchen in your mother's apron. Um, well, tell me about what you're doing. Um, that would have been a radically different experience for that, for that child um, than um, just solely the experience of being shamed, looked at with disdain, sort of this intense feeling of self-consciousness is evoked. Um, and the message that one begins to tell oneself in that experience is that I'm defective. Carrying forward sort of the interpersonal dimension of um, shame, de Young in a more recent book um, talks about shame as the disintegration of oneself in relation to a disintegrating other. So de Young, in many ways sort of carries Coffin's idea forward a little bit to identify the particular role of a dysregulating other, um, that it's that it's the interpersonal bridge that is severed, but really that it's that severing is caused by a dysregulating other. Um, for de Young, relationships hold 
um, you know, sort of like lead to a sense of self and are a part of one's experience of sort of integrated wholeness. And when, when the relationship is severed, as Kaufman describes, by another that is dysregulating in some way, uh, de Young argues that the experience of one's integrity, um, uh, you know, the one's integrity of self is undermined. And that chronic exposure to these shaming circumstances, which again can occur in a, a number of different ways, and want to just call attention to that one of the ways here that that can occur, of course, is with systemic oppression and the messages that one um, receives about who one is um, when we're talking about instances of identity-based harm, or even just the vicarious impact um, that one see that one experiences, say, when um, say an African American child, a black child, sort of hears about um, another police shooting um, of a of a black man, um, or you know that a um, trans teen hears about another uh, another murder of a um, trans woman of color. That 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 message, um, you know, that that message um, is is you know directly communicated to the individual. And that we can, you know, thinking of that in terms of de Young's work, we can think about the way in which that causes this disintegrating experience, this dis disintegrating experience of oneself, and also the ongoing anticipation of further experiences that will cause a degradation and a disintegration of oneself. And we can see in this kind of inherent in this idea of disintegration is really this sense that shame causes a deeply existential threat to who, to one's sense of self, to who one is. Another piece I want to mention here around shame, um, this idea of interpersonal inhibitory protection. So we can think about shame, this sort of in some ways is similar to um, Shore's idea of neurobiological regulator, but instead of focusing on, on toddlerhood, we can think about how um, in instances of interpersonal shaming or interpersonal trauma, the way in which um, some, some individuals have the experience of um, shame taking over their experience during the event. And we can think about this as a neurobiological process that is protective. So maybe better explained by example, that like for, for example, um, I'm thinking of you know several several folks that I've worked with who are uh, members of the queer community who um, I'm thinking of maybe some gay men I've worked with who in childhood were really mistreated for maybe being um, slightly effeminate in their presentation who were bullied for being queer or being perceived as queer in some way. Many of these men talk about how you know like um, I just felt so embarrassed and so ashamed of who I was in the moment I just froze, and when when sort of working with these men sort of identifying that under that freeze is a great deal of rage a great deal of outrage about the mistreatment that one faced in that moment but there's a good likelihood that had that rage had that adaptive emotion been expressed it very likely would have caused more damage it would have caused maybe intensification of the bullying or even interpersonal violence and so we can think about shame as having this interpersonal in inhibitory function where it keeps the individual from engaging in what we would think of as the very natural hardwired action tendencies and emotions that when expressed sort of help us to maintain our sense of self and also help us to maintain our safety. But that there are some circumstances in which to express those or to sort of engage those adaptive action tendencies would actually be to put oneself at further risk. So this is another way that we can sort of conceptualize and think about shame. I should mention here um, that you're seeing on these slides different um, images from alchemical texts, um, a number of different alchemical texts just want to, um, I wish I'd mentioned this earlier, but I want just to invite you to sort of, as you're listening to this presentation, just to kind of take in the image and sort of see what resonates with you about the image. Um, just to go back for a moment, you know, so lots of very kind of gruesome and graphic um, 
images from alchemical texts. This one here, a representation of the separatio phase, separating out and sort of um, dis you know, um, distinguishing and pulling things apart um, and sort of to be able to kind of look at them and see them differently and how that can at times be a very painful process um, like dismemberment. Or here you have the king at the, um, you have the, uh, the um, drowning king in the background who's drowning in a body, a body of water and a new king who is emerging in the foreground, sort of thinking about this idea of the death of an old form of consciousness um, and the, re the rebirth or the birth of a new form of consciousness that integrates more of who one is. So Kaufman's work, I mentioned earlier, this idea of pathogenic shame, and this is where we see a number of different things happen. The first is that we, um, we see shame becoming tightly or sort of um, indelibly linked to one's identity. So we go from the experience of being shamed and humiliated by others to sh really shaming oneself. Um, and we, you know, we can think about how um, th again, there's sort of this protective nature to shaming oneself because if one ongoingly shames oneself, one is less likely to put oneself in situations where shame will be induced again. One begins to live a smaller and smaller and more constricted life where fewer risks are taken so as not to put oneself in any kind of a circumstance that could lead to further shame or any kind of embarrassment or humiliation. Um, Coffin says that Shame becomes internalized via the beliefs and attitudes that are held by others about us, um, by the ways we are treated by others, and by the unconscious images we carry of shaming interactions that we have with others. I just want to mention here, um, again, just sort of bringing in a macro systems perspective and thinking some about um, systemic oppression. Certainly things like homophobia, racism, transphobia, ableism, you know, um, and, and the negative unconscious, you know, and sometimes conscious, you know, covert and overt forms of uh, these, you know, types of mistreatment and these systemic forms of oppression definitely, you know, live in the attitudes of those around us and are definitely a part of someone's experience who lives with a marginalized identity, that it's just a part of the cultural, you know, sort of waters that one swims in. And um, for Kaufman is, is, you know, kind of when that is the case, when those beliefs are carried, you know, widely by others and, and they manifest in day-to-day in -day life and there's evidence of those beliefs existing and sort of how they are played out and lived in structures that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that is internalized. That is one of the ways that, that, it, that this becomes internalized. Um, and this, you know, internalization really leads to a primary premise. And this is where I want to just, you know, give a brief mention to complexes, which I'll then talk about a little bit further in a moment. Um, but if we think about sort of complexes from a Jungian perspective, these sort of um, internal, um, unconscious, fragmented parts of the psyche that really hold um, their own subjectivity, that hold their own set of memories, that hold their own central premise. Um, what I call a central premise, kind of a central idea that kind of holds the, the whole of the complex together. Um, when we think about the internalization of shame, we're really talking about a central premise that there is something wrong with me. Um, we have this deeply ingrained sense that there's something wrong with me. Just as a slight sidebar, you know, when I work with clients um, and we get to this place where we're really coming to sort of uncover this idea that the client believes that there's something deeply wrong with them, and even when they say that, um, I will often ask, you know, so in all the time that you've been living with this sense that there's something terribly wrong with you, have you figured out what it is? And invariably, most clients are not able to answer that question. Um, they're not able to say, yes, I figured it out. Here is precisely what's wrong with me. And that is the thing about shame, which we'll talk a little bit about when we talk about prima materia, is that shame is this very sort of elusive and pervasive, insidious experience once it's internalized. 
And it goes beyond naming in so many ways, um, beyond just sort of saying, I feel that there's something terribly wrong with me. So Kaufman also mentions um, that uh, shame becomes tightly wound with different emotional experiences that we have. So certain emotions that um, elicited shame or some other painful response like neglect or mistreatment, uh, that these feelings and emotions, they become um, prohibited. So for example, like a client who's... Um, whose anger toward an abusive father was met with further abuse. Um, anger becomes a shamed emotion and the, the person comes to learn um, that anger is not safe to express. And that any time anger begins to emerge, um, one will often experience a sense of shame. Um, Or, for example, another client thinking of who, um, you know, when as a child, when they would cry, would sent to, were sent to their room and told not to come out until they were done crying. Um, so sadness becoming bound with shame. So this is where, like, you know, we can see in our, in our clients who tend to be sort of um, phobic around particular feelings and expressing particular emotions or, or, or um, expressing assertiveness, that oftentimes that you know people have clients have trouble with this when um, when that ex when that expression when that feeling is tightly wound with shame, and a part of the work as we'll see is kind of beginning to tease apart what was I not allowed to express and coming to sort of see how shame inhibited that. The same is true as well with needs um, that if you know what if there are certain needs. Um, that were shamed in any way. So of course, like, you know, throughout our life, we have the need for relationship, we have the need for identification or touching and holding, we have the need for affirmation, the need to nurture, the need for power, you know, many different needs that we have as human beings. When these are shamed, they, we can think about them as becoming, you know, similar to emotions, sort of outcast members of our psyche, outcast components of our psyche. Um, outcast is the word that comes from um, uh, Richard Schwartz's work in internal family systems. Um, really, I think about it in terms of complexes, sort of parts of the psyche that get kind of shut out from consciousness that hold these painful experiences and hold different needs that we have that weren't allowed to be experienced. And then again, if these needs arise and, you know, later on, um, oftentimes the complex um, we can you know, think about like how the complex kind of brings with it a sense of anxiety or a sense of shame. So we move forward, I just want to talk a little bit about complexes just here, knowing that chances are this, this idea is very familiar to you. I want to give what I think is one of Jung's best definitions um, from a review of complex theory, and this says that complexes are psychic fragments which have split off owing to traumatic influences. Complexes interfere with the will and disturb conscious, perform conscience, conscious performance. They produce disturbances of memory and blockages in the flow of association. They can temporarily obsess consciousness or influence speech and action in an unconscious way. Complexes are independent beings. I really appreciate this definition and the way in which it speaks to the autonomy of the complex. So these are fragmented parts of the psyche that are split off owing to the fact that in the moment they're un, uh, intolerable and the person is unable to integrate them into ego awareness and to consciousness and so instead they are relegated to the unconscious and what happens over time is that experiences that are even remotely similar to that original sort of um, shaming or traumatic experience begin to kind of gather around like the complex has a magnetic pull and it begins to gather um, more and more associations more and more experiences over time and kind of build an arsenal of evidence for why um, the world is not safe for why um, you know others cannot be trusted or any other host of central premises that lie at the center of the complex so we can think about shame and complex, um, you know, in that complexes contain one or more emotionally charged images and an inner coherence. So we talked earlier about how um, shame 
you know, kind of leads to this inner um, coherence, this inner idea of oneself as bad, as wrong, as defective. Similarly, um, complexes have this autonomous, um, they're, they're, they have their own autonomy um, and have their own history and subjectivity and will and repetitive actions that they that tend to overtake consciousness. Shame very much has these same qualities. And I would argue that shame is a complex. Um, and so that when, sh when um, that shame can be triggered and kind of takes over consciousness in this very autonomous way and, um, and kind of compels us to engage in particular kinds of behavior to reduce the likelihood of further shame. And we'll talk a little bit further about that. As well, shame, um, I'm sorry, complexes resist the influence of consciousness. So we can't just talk ourselves out of a complex, just in the same way that we cannot simply talk ourselves out of shame. When I began to work with folks and kind of focus extensively um, in my clinical work on shame, um, I, you know, initially, you know, attempted to sort of try to, um, you know, sort of help clients change their ways of thinking. Um, in, a, in a sort of a CBT kind of way uh, to see if that would cause any effect on the experience of shame um, and the, the thoughts and repetitive actions that were associated with it. And I have to say, I didn't find very much luck doing so. My experience now tells me that really what has to happen is the client needs to have an experience, um, that it's not enough to change one's thoughts when it comes to shame. One needs to have an embodied experience of something new and of something different, and also needs to kind of look at shame in an embodied way, including thoughts, but also including the sensations that are associated with it, the different emotional experiences that are associated with it, and really what got um, outcast in the process of being shamed over the course of one life and beginning to reintegrate those experiences. Kaufman um, uh, talks some about the way in which particular forms of pathology or symptoms can manifest um, as a result of shame. And I've been in the process of kind of developing some ideas around this as well for an article. Um, and so just to mention here briefly, um, Kaufman mentions um, depression that you know there's this sort of prolonged sense of distress and, and shame um and that this um you know sort of the 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 um, sense of oneself and the sense of defectiveness that comes with shame um you know kind of can almost take on kind of this characterological quality that can really cause um a darkening of the mood with anxiety, we often see this in terms of shame related to wanting to control the environment in order to reduce the possibility of further shame-inducing circumstances. Can also be, um, you know, relatedly can be associated with really kind of um, a defensive strategy of feeling like one has to perform in order to be seen in a particular light, and that can come with a fair amount of anxiety as well. Um, we can see it in compulsive behavior, like the use of some object like drugs or sex to escape intense feelings of shame. Um, but then, of course, we know that shame is compounded by the sense of powerlessness that one experiences over that addictive process. Certainly in traumatic stress, we see shame, um, kind of the deep sense of fault that can sometimes accompany certain kinds of trauma. Um, we can see it in relationship problems. Um, where relationship problems are associated with particular defensive strategies that one uses to manage shame in relationship to others. And I'll talk about those defensive strategies in a moment. Um, or maybe, you know, where the vulnerability that is required in intimate relationship is really defended against because it's associated with shame. So difficulties that one might have in opening up in relationships. And then finally, we can think too about how personality disorders can be sort of a characterological embodiment of particular defenses against shame. So let me mention these. So Kaufman outlines a number of different defenses against shame. Um, and these are really um, adaptations to outer reality that become internalized over time. Um, 
And these are, we can think about them, if we think about them in terms of complexes, we can think about kind of there's this automatic interpersonal habit that the complex has when a person is possessed by the complex, when consciousness is possessed by the complex. Um, and an individual may employ um, one of these um, defending strategies or many of them, um, though I have found in my work that one usually predominates. So the first is rage, hostility, and bitterness. Um, so these are th these are more typical among folks who tend to be more extroverted. Um, and this is really just the process of keeping others away by, you know, in order to prevent further shaming circumstances. Um, and the person might use just sort of general hostility, uh, explosive forms of reactivity, um, bitterness towards others. Um, we might think, if we think of Karen Horney's work, we might think of like the moving against neurotic style. Um, contempt, really the distancing of oneself um, from others by elevating oneself is better than. This is where kind of comparison becomes the primary strategy. Um, and, and of course, in contempt, comparing oneself positively. This is often found um, in individuals who were treated with a great deal of disdain in their early life. Um, we can think about um, striving for power and control. This is kind of compensating for a deep need of def um, for a deep sense of defectiveness by striving for power and control over others, because really, when one has power over others, one is less likely to feel vulnerable and therefore less likely to feel shame. Um, and one, if you if there is a sense of internalized shame, exerting power over others really satisfies a need for um, a sense of efficacy that one did not have in the past. Striving for perfection is another. Um, this is attempting to be perfect so as to avoid further shame. Um, often comes with a fair amount of anxiety. It's really about erasing any signs of defectiveness and striving to, striving to really be acceptable to others. Um, this can you know, occur in a number of different ways. Perfectionism in school, perfectionism in particular areas of one's life. Um, trying to be all things to all people at the cost of being oneself. Um, and they're often, you know, similar to um, contempt, um, oftentimes in striving for, for, for perfection, there is also an element of comparison, but usually involves comparison, comparing oneself negatively to others. Uh, we have um, internal withdrawal. This is more typical among more introverted individuals, and this is really the process of withdrawing inward from human, you know, interaction, so to avoid um, the possibility of shame altogether. Um, and then finally, blaming and fault finding. This is occurs, of course, like when shame, a sense of shame is activated in the individual and it's so intolerable that the person really externalizes it and really kind of um, blames others um, and has a hard time sort of recognizing their own part in something. And this is, of course, a very highly externalized locus of control that can leave um, leave, leave folks feeling a deep sense of powerlessness over the course of their own life and of the, you know and over the people who are in their life. So going to move now into um, some of the material on alchemy and kind of integrating alchemy and shame and then um, along the way hopefully as well, you know sort of talking some about a particular case that I will mention. I want to give just a little bit of an overview, um, a brief, brief kind of scratching the surface intro of alchemy. Um, so alchemy, you know, really concerns itself with the operations that are used to transform some sort of base material or base matter into something that is more refined. Most commonly, you know, in um, the alchemical texts, it's usually something like transforming something like lead into gold. There are various different um, kind of systems of alchemy that draw from different cultures around the world in different um, time periods um, over the last many thousands of years. Um, alchemy is, um, if we, if we, you know, so Jung was really interested in alchemy and began to, and was one of the first to really look at alchemy for the symbolic language that it sort of prevents for the individuation process and for the psychotherapy process. And he wrote extensively on this. Um, uh, sort of the metaphorical value that alchemy has um, when thinking about how people grow and change um, and develop over the course of their life and also how that happens in therapy. Um, 
alchemy, you know, in different systems of alchemy involve different um, procedures or operations, and these are non-linear. Um, so Edinger says that the sequence of operations is not significant, and we'll talk about that in a moment when we look at a particular set of um, alchemical operations. Um, Edinger is really clear that alchemy, you know, so we could say that that alchemy and like um, and what we're talking about there really is like individuation, growth, change, clinical change in psychotherapy. It requires patience, it requires courage, and it requires perseverance. Um, and I've certainly found this to be true when addressing shame in psychotherapy with my clients. It, it really cannot be rushed. Um, both I think the client and the therapist have to be patient. And it's anxiety provoking to address one's shame. It's anxiety provoking to look at one's history and sort of come to understand how one comes to shame oneself and really like what was lost as a result of all the shaming that one has done to themselves that was internalized over time. The alchemical opus is the creation of the world. And this is, this is in many of the different images that we see in alchemical texts. This is really kind of what Edinger says is like the individuated psyche defined beyond the collective. So, you know, Jungian work, I think, um, you know, does a decent job of sort of balancing the importance of individu individuating and becoming who one is, but still in relationship to the collective. We can think about shame as um, the, a process that is induced by the collective, by a dysregulating other who's a member of the collective, who says that we should behave in a particular way. Um, and in this way, when we think about the al alchemy of shame, we're thinking about how does one come to define themselves beyond those shaming messages that one received from the collective. Um, thinking a little bit about this further, um, uh, it's really kind of like, this creation of the world is really um, sort of this broad vantage point that one has on oneself, on one on one's world, on one's relationships, and one's place amidst all of those. Um, and this holds particularly, you know, particular importance given that shame results from expectations again from others, um, from the collective. Then finally. Um, you know, psychotherapeutic interventions can support the alchemical processes that contribute to healing, um, the healing of shame. And I'll talk some about that in my, um, in my um, later slides. So one I mentioned here, prima materia. So prima materia and alchemy is really the, it's the base starting point. It's the material that the alchemist begins to work with um, in the transformation of something into gold. So if we're thinking about prima materia, in many cases it's lead. It's sort of the, the, the earliest, the rawest material. Um, this often represents material that is contained in the shadow. For Jung, in mu much of his writings, the shadow and the personal unconscious were synonymous, and really the personal unconscious is the home to complexes. So we can think about this as shame as prima materia, shame as complex, shame as prima materia. So when we're talking about the alchemy of shame and psychotherapy, we're talking about working with the raw material of one's complexes that relate to and hold and um, that hold shame. Um, Edinger says that the prima materia is the raw material of the work or psychologically, metaphorically, that would refer to the basic matter or the nub of the matter, the problem to be resolved. Um, with regard to shame, um, as you know, we can think about, well, let me go through these first, actually. So there are some characteristics of the prima materia from the alchemical text. So one um, is that it's ubiquitous. It's found everywhere. The equivalent I draw from that, what I was mentioning earlier, is the way in which shame is insidious and that it really, when internalized and kind of in this pathogenic form, really pervades one's life, pervades one's sense of oneself. Um, the prima materia is vile and despised. It's how it's often talked about in the, um, the uh, alchemical text, that it's rejected by consciousness. And we can think about how shame is experientially intolerable and is defended against. It is a really um, intolerable and uncomfortable experience. Prima materia has a quality of multiplicity. It takes many forms. 
And shame and the defenses that we use against shame also takes many forms. Shame is undifferent, or I'm sorry, prima materia is undifferentiated. It has no boundaries. And again, shame often manifests as this pervasive sense that there's something wrong with me. So these are some of the, um, the sort of parallels that I draw here. Again, to quote Edinger, um, prima materia is found in the shadow, the part of the personality that is considered most despicable. Those aspects of ourselves most painful and most humiliating are the very ones to be brought forward and worked with in psychotherapy. So certainly, you know, we think about and can really understand and think about that quote in terms of shame. In alchemy, um, the, the alchemical vessel, or what's sometimes referred to as the alchemical vase, the, the container in which the work of alchemy is done, is um, really important, and there's a lot written on the alchemical vessel. This sort of womb-like container where alchemical substances intermingle and transform. Jung saw this as a metaphor for the therapeutic um, relationship. One of the things that I often think about myself is how... Um, the defenses against shame, we could sort of see. So defenses contain, right? Defenses serve this purpose of kind of containing something that's intolerable, keeping it in the unconscious, and um, and you know, kind of protecting consciousness. There's also sort of the, it, it, the, there's this you know the, there's this containing function that's a part of that, and we can th I can think about I do often think about how. Um, the defenses against shame are sort of a, f a false vessel, um, a vessel that is not capable of true alchemy. And this is why, you know, so many of our clients come to us really struggling with um, the ways in which their defenses and their defensiveness gets in the way of them having meaningful relationships and a meaningful life. So I think about the defenses of shame as um, a as, the, as a false vessel, necessary at the time to protect us and to protect ourselves, you know, especially in our early life. But as we get older and we move through the world and the world becomes more complex um, and more is demanded of us relationally, um, we could say that it, do, you know, it doesn't serve us in the same way. So carrying this forward a little bit, um, we can think about um, the alchemical vessel and our in the therapeutic relationship. Um, the alchemical vessel has to be made from the proper material, has to be heated to the um, right, precisely the right temperature. There's a lot that goes into kind of how the vessel is made and how the vessel is worked with during the alchemical process. In my mind, this speaks really of, the, of you know, metaphorically of the therapeutic relationship. Um, so I say here that preparing for the work is part of the work. So, so much of, um, you know, I think the work of, you know, of, of shame and transforming shame in psychotherapy is how we prepare to do that work, um, is how we prepare um, the therapeutic relationship how do we begin to restore the interpersonal bridge with our client via the therapeutic relationship? So when I talk about restoring the interpersonal bridge and the therapeutic relationship, I'm talking about very simple things that we all know to do as clinicians. Engaging with warmth and with empathy and with kindness and being helpful and validating from the get-go, from the very first interactions with our clients really delighting in our clients and our clients' impulse towards health. Remember, you know, I mentioned earlier how, you know, shame can be induced during a moment of delight where the delight of, you know, a sympathetic activity is suddenly shut down by a parasympathetic um, sort of surge um, that is induced by a dysregulating other. And so as we begin to delight and show our delight in our clients and show our delight in their capacity for growth and their, in, their, their sort of um, impulse to seek more you know, fulfillment in their lives, we can delight in that. Um, and so a number of different ways of do this. I tend to work quite relationally with my clients. And so some of the ways in which I might do this, um, you know, it, let's say I'm, I'm, I say, for example, to a client, um, like, 
maybe I, I say to a client, like, what's it like for you to be so vulnerable with me today and to hear that I appreciate your vulnerability? I'm just kind of like ongoingly in my work, kind of constantly attending to the therapeutic relationship, to the therapeutic, the alchemical vessel that's holding us by asking about it, by directing the client's attention to it, by asking the client sort of in this meta-processing way, what's it like for them to receive and, and feel my delight in them or to feel that I appreciate them and what they're doing and the work that they're doing. Um, and this, this also, when we ask questions like that, it also tells us a lot about where the alchemical vessel is for the client. So oftentimes, you know, early in the work with clients, um, you know, when I ask that kind of a question, um, you know, if I, if I say, you know, what's it like to hear me appreciate how vulnerable you're being with me? You know, it's not uncommon for me to hear from my clients, you know, like, well, you're just saying that because you're my therapist or, uh, yeah, that's nice to hear, but you don't really know who I am. Um, that's a gauge for how, how sturdy the alchemical vessel is for that client at that point in time. A client in that state who responds in that way is obviously not ready to move into um, deep shame work. Mindfulness and curiosity, I think another way that we can think about the alchemical vessel is in terms of a mindful stance and, and, and a stance of curiosity towards experience. When, when I think about mindfulness, I think about kind of the um, helping the client to cultivate the capacity to tolerate some level of shame, cultivating the capacity to kind of be with shame versus being the shame. If we think in terms of complexes for a moment, this is like, you know, mindfulness is so key when working with complexes because we have to help the client um, to develop a mindful stance towards the complex. The nature of the complex is to just overtake consciousness. And by consistently working to gain some separation and to increase the capacity to kind of look at the complex without it kind of possessing consciousness really helps. Um, and so um, helping the client to do that when the shame is a part of what they're experiencing in the moment can be a really helpful thing to do. So I might ask the client or suggest to the client, can you just stay with the physical sensation of that shame? Um, or might ask them to see if they can you if there's an image that captures it. Like, is there an image that captures that negative feeling about yourself? Um, or what other negative things does that story say about you? So when the client is in shame, inviting them with some questions to see if they can get just a little bit of a, um, of a separation from it to be able to kind of look at it, e either via physical sensation, via an image. Um, related to this as well as curiosity and really helping the client to cultivate curiosity about their experiences of shame. Um, so for example, saying something like, you know, um, you know, thoughts are just stories and thoughts are just theories. Can we get curious about this theory that you have that you're stupid? Or can we get curious about this theory that you have that you're worthless? So I'm inviting the client to begin to have some curiosity about it. We can ask some things like, you know, do you remember when that story first came into your life or when you first developed that theory that you're stupid? Um, another question I like to ask is who inside of you believes that about you? This again, really just about kind of encouraging curiosity and kind of with that gaining some separation from the complex of shame, helping the client to look at it and begin to kind of get curious about it versus being completely consumed by it. Related to the alchemical vessel as well, we can think about, um, defense work and working with client defenses. Um, what I sometimes think about like is kind of like, you know, creating the true vessel. If the, if the defense is the false vessel, I want us to be able to kind of work with each other and work with the defenses in such a way where they're no longer as necessary in therapy with me. So the client has the experience of really kind of the true alchemical vessel of relationship. Um, so let's see here. Um, 
this is you know a, a number of different things that we can do around defense work um, just want to mention here really just appreciating defenses as, as a starting point letting the client know that we're not going to just try to tear them down um so saying like you know something like you know i could really appreciate that you might not want to look at me right now because this feels so embarrassing to you um, and I think it's fine that you don't look at me right now. So the defense of averting one's gaze and not making contact, you know, that's a defense. And in that moment, it's completely fine. And I think it's important that we convey to the client that it's completely fine. We can also bypass defenses. Um, you know, when the oftentimes... Um, Clients will get hyperverbal when we get close to shame and so and might begin to kind of engage in a lot of storytelling. And so I just oftentimes just kind of walk right past that and just say, yes, Anne, can we come back to this experience of humiliation that you had at work? Or yes, and can we come back to this um, feeling that you're not good enough in your relationship. I'll just sort of say, yes, and let's go back to the matter at hand, kind of just bypassing it. Can also, um, I think it can be helpful to, like, you know, when defenses are present, to, to use what if questions. Like, what if, um, let's say, like, the client is maybe talking about, um, uh, about a work situation often comes up, shame, shaming situations often come up at work, um, describing a work situation where they um, are um, feeling, uh, maybe blaming a coworker and engaging in the defense of blame that Kaufman talks about, blaming a coworker for something that they themselves feel shameful about. Um, just sort of asking like, well, what if, what if it wasn't your coworker's fault? What would that say about you if it wasn't your coworker's fault? Um, again, it's like kind of bypassing the defense. It's about kind of working with the defense. I think as well, you know, I should have maybe just mentioned this first, just naming the defense. You know, like I can see how painful this is for you to talk about and I can see you not wanting to talk about it right now. I just want to name that, that I see it and that it's okay. There's a lot that we, a lot more I think that we could say about the chemical vessel, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move forward here. So stages of alchemy, I mentioned earlier that there are different variations of these stages from different alchemical traditions, from different parts of history, different time periods. Um, these are the those that are laid out by um, Edinger. And I'm going to highlight um, just those that are starred here, calcinatio, salutio, coagulatio, and mortificatio, and separatio. You, I want to invite you to remember that um, these are not linear. And, um, you know, I have found that, you know, like kind of like multiple operations can be happening at the same time for a client. And I also think, too, that we sort of, when, I, when I'm thinking about alchemy and working with shame, I want to mention, too, that like there's sort of the moment-to-moment -moment tracking of different alchemical processes that are occurring in the moment, in the therapy. And then there's sort of at this meta level, kind of like the bigger picture, more ongoing alchemical operations that are happening around, happening around shame in the client's life. So they happen in sort of these microcosm ways, moment by moment, but then more in the uh, simultaneously in these bigger picture kinds of ways um, in the more enduring elements of the client's life. So I'm going to talk about um, these alchemical operations um, uh, in terms of Zach. Um, a client, um, that's a pseudonym, of course, this is a 31 year old cisgender African American gay identified individual. I was thinking on presenting, a, 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 I was thinking of presenting on a different client, um, a trans individual, but I decided to change my mind and go with Zach instead. Um, he presented a therapy with anxiety and severe depression, had a history of bullying in childhood and adolescence, um, both at school and in his family. Um, repeated encounters with overt and covert forms of racism, um, had a history of failed relationships, and, you know, sort of, you know, in his own words, like, was really not able to kind of tolerate any kind of tension in, in relationships or conflict, and um, would oftentimes just withdraw. Um, or, um, you know, as he described it, like, I'm a doormat. I just let people kind of walk all over me. Um, so I'm gonna kind of weave Zach in throughout our talk here of these different alchemical um, operations that I'm gonna talk about. So first, looking at the the at thinking about the vessel. So Zach presented with perfectionism and also with withdrawal. 
um, these kind of these strategies of being like the perfect client and also um, had uh, a tendency at times to kind of withdraw in the therapy. Um, so when I think about some about Kaufman's defending strategies, I think that those were two of the kind of primary that he um, utilized. Um, he sought me out um, knowing that I'm a gay therapist, um, which did seem to help. Um, this is where I want to say, you know, where the client knowing a little bit more about us can really um, be helpful with um, reducing shame and making the client feel more comfortable. Even though I work psychodynamically with clients, I don't think that a blank slate is particularly helpful um, for working with shame with clients. Um, so in terms of attending to the vessel, some of the things I did in our work with and our work together, especially early on in our relationship, um, was first of all, just to make our relationship explicit. So, you know, even in the first session, really sort of like, you know, saying and asking things like, how is that to say that to me? Um, or what's it like to be with me right now here in this moment? Um, how's it going between us right now as we're having this conversation? What's your sense of me as you're saying this right now? What do you see on my face? Um, you know, oftentimes clients will see judgment on our face where there is none. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really, you know, when working with shame can be really important. I want to really, um, I want the client to know what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking about. And so if I have the sense that the client might be concerned in some way that I'm judging them, especially in a case like Zach's where he's working so hard to be the perfect client, I want to make sure that I, um, that he knows what I'm thinking and that he knows, and, and because of that, then, you know, thinking about um, the third bullet point here, self-disclosure, really important in working with shame. Um, just to go up above for a moment to broaching the difference between differences between us. So I'm a white therapist. So it felt really important, um, uh, you know, to, to, to name that and for us to kind of broach the conversation about that difference between us, that although we could relate um, as gay men to each other and maybe sort of could resonate around different experiences that we might share with that, that I certainly um, don't have the experiences that he has with racism. Um, and... Um, so, you know, asking him how it was, um, for him knowing, um, that there may be aspects of his experience, um, that I can't necessarily relate to. Additionally, asking as well, like, you know, how, how is it for him to know that there are aspects of his, his experience that I could relate to personally as a gay man? Um, asking him as well, sort of in advance, and this was early in our work, um, how it would be for him to discuss issues related to racism with me, and if there are things that I can do that would help that make, make him feel safer um, in doing so. Um, so really conveying, because of course, like this is one of those places where shame, um, you know, any kind of unconscious shaming on the therapist's part to the client, if they're uncomfortable about um, something that the client is sharing about their experiences of racism, that of course only sort of reinforces the shame that we're trying to kind of undo and work through. Lots of delighting in Zach and his strengths. Um, of course, you know, like what was tricky with him is not delighting in his perfectionism, but delighting in, in his strengths. Uh, encouraging curiosity and mindfulness in a number of different ways with him. Um, uh, let's see, just thinking, I'll see if I have any notes here of an example. Um, well, I'll just, I'll just keep moving on for the sake of time. Um, and then again, kind of doing that work of appreciating and, and, and bypassing defenses. Um, at one point, um, uh, when he was talking about his last relationship, um, you know, saying something like, you know, I think we can really appreciate that part of you that gets scared of expressing feelings, that part of you has served you so well for so long, kind of appreciating the defense to help it soften. Um, so if we move, so this is about kind of the, the building of the vessel of the relationship. If we move to the next um, operation here, the separatio phase. So in separatio, what I, this is what I sort of think about as one, one of the more important aspects of the work. And this is really that part of teasing apart one's identity from shame. In alchemy, it's a phase um, in which the alchemical mixture undergoes a process of discrimination into its component parts. So it's this like this, there's this process of distinguishing and discriminating that becomes really important. 
And so based on the, you know, kind of the work of mindfulness and curiosity, the person comes to sort of, you know, come to um, begin to sort of see different aspects of their experience. So if we think about separating from complexes, um, we can attribute the shame to a younger part of the self. We can attribute the shame to a complex inside. So we can say something like, you know, if the client says something really negative about themselves, we can ask, you know, who inside believes that about you? Or whose voice is that? Um, we can offer some psychoeducation to help the client begin to separate from their complexes. We can talk about parts work and utilize parts work as a way to do that. Um, we can help the client to become aware of and establish separation from the complexes when they get possessed by it. So really teaching the client to pay attention to the somatic markers of being possessed by shame, being possessed by the, the shame complex, so that the person can begin to say, oh, I know what this is. I'm feeling shame right now. Or, oh, there's that, there's that young part of me that's carrying so much shame. I really feel it activated right now. When the client's in a state where they can begin to do that more and more, you're really... Um, cooking with fire and, and when, when we're thinking about alchemy you're cooking with fire if the client's able to do that um, to move forward here um, thinking about framing shame in terms of its interpersonal origins this is where we help the client to identify the circumstances in which shame arose um, so saying things to the client like oh so when that happened they were putting their shame on you that wasn't yours that was theirs that they put on you and somehow that got inside of you um, so really beginning to kind of, again, tease apart and identify the components, the component pieces of this puzzle of shame, beginning to kind of see them in a more nuanced way. Um, separating emotions and needs from shame. If we go back to Kaufman's idea of shame and emotion binds and um, need shame binds, we begin to separate those two things from each other, helping the client to sort of identify and understand that when certain emotions come up, it seems that shame comes up with them, or when it comes to asserting a need or sharing a need. And in the case of um, Zach, um, this was a really important part of his work, where in his relationships, he couldn't really assert any of his needs, couldn't let a, let a partner know what was needed emotionally, um, because to do so was too anxiety provoking, and he felt too embarrassed to do so. So really becoming, getting clear and helping him to get clear that the shame is something separate from the need and the shame is something separate from the emotion. This is the process of separatio. If we think about salutio, salutio is another phase of alchemy um, and an alchemy salutio is the dissolution of the substance in water or some other solvent, often tears. And in my mind, I really think about salutio. One aspect of salutio is the deep, um, deep amount of grief that's often involved with shame. Um, I think about the grief work that we have to do as a client undergoes the process of separatio and comes to sort of see the circumstances in, under which shame developed in their life, coming to sort of see what they had to kind of push away, the needs and the emotions they had to push away. Oftentimes what arises organically is a sense of grief about having been disconnected from those parts of themselves. So this is again that kind of that um, disruption of the bridge to oneself and to others. Um, there's, there's pain that results from that and grief. And so we can think about the kind of the grief that has to happen, how we work to kind of welcome the sadness um, associated with um, having been mistreated, how we welcome the sadness and the grief related to having lived such a constricted life as a result of shame. Related to this as well, and we can think about this in the imagery of salutio, which has to do with water and the way in which water softens things. There's this other opportunity, um, and, and Edinger says it here, the fixed static aspects of the personality allow for no change. For transformation to proceed, these fist, fixed aspects must be dissolved. This is where the um, defenses soften e even more. Um, that you know that sadness and that grief was sort of kept at bay it was hidden it was defended against and um, 
those defenses are rigid and they're hard and that as the person you've probably seen this in your clinical work the more that the person can come to sort of feel the more vulnerable feelings in a titrated manner the less of a need there is for the, those defenses and they begin to soften because there's the true container of the therapeutic relationship holding those emotions not and that does not require that the client um, use defenses to hold them just moving a little bit more quickly here because I'm aware of the time. Calcinatio, this is a phase um, in alchemy where it's the process of burning off the dross or the unrefined elements um, remaining in the substance. And uh, Edinger says that it's the process of drying out waterlogged complexes. So from Jung's perspective, complexes hold a great deal of energy. And this is why from a Jungian perspective, when someone has a lot of unresolved complexes, oftentimes their life, their conscious life is very barren because there's so much energy trapped in the, um, in the complexes in the unconscious. So this is what I think of as work that is about kind of helping the client begin to release adaptive action tendencies. So I mentioned earlier the way in which Shame has this in, uh, interpersonal inhibitory function to protect the person from doing anything, from fighting back or from defending themselves. Um, that impulse to do that is still contained within the nervous system. Um, I think a lot about gestalt work here and kind of completing, um, completing gestalt cycles. And so that's much of what this work is about. It's really about discharging the complex. And so when I do this work with clients, it's really about um, exploring shaming scenes from the person's history um, and um, thinking about like, what did the client need back then when this happened? Uh, what did, what, you know, was it protection? Was it safety? Was it to express their rage? Was it to defend themselves? And this isn't always going back very far in history. Zach and I did a lot of work together at, you know, recent experiences of racism. Um, one particular piece of work we did about an encounter he had in a Costco where someone said something um, really terrible to him. And of course, here he is um, in a Costco, predominantly white setting, and did not feel safe saying, hey, that's not okay. So a whole piece of work, um, if, you know, kind of in an experiential way using kind of portrayal work from experiential therapy to really express his rage and express his outrage and express his anger. And really the work of then kind of validating that becomes so important when we're thinking about shame work because um, those feelings were kept at bay um, because they were not allowed. And the healing happens when those feelings are welcomed back into the fold and begin to have a place at the table. So really my affirming them in turn hopefully helps him to affirm them as well. And this can be, of course, really intense. And Edinger says here, baptism in blood, like the encounter with fire, refers psychologically to the ordeal of enduring intense affect. If the ego holds, the ordeal has a refining and consolidating effect. And this image, of course, like really speaks to this, that kind of like working through the Casanatio phase, phase is very intense. And you see here the wolf is, um, the gray wolf is eating the king. Then in the, in the background, the gray wolf has been thrown into the fire where it burns up and a new king emerges, a new way of being, a new kind of consciousness. Moving forward here, mortificatio. Um, and uh, this is in alchemy, the process of, um, um, it's the process that blots out the nature um, and transmutes everything into a new nature. So it sort of blots out the old nature and transmutes everything into a new nature. And really psychologically, we're talking about, you know, the way in which this represents the death of an old way of being um, so that a new way of being can emerge, similar to the previous, the image on the previous slide. Um, so we can think about the death of a shame-based identity. This is where someone really begins to sort of see um, and, and let go of the shell of who they were that was 
primarily predicated on an identity of shame. Um, this is where the complexes um, exert less of an influence on consciousness and the client begins to let go of the old ways of thinking about themselves that were largely driven by the complex so that a new way of thinking about oneself begins to emerge and so that one can begin to kind of creatively and existentially begin to form a new sense of themselves. So it's about moving away you know, from sort of the old way of thinking of oneself to understanding oneself um, in a new way. Related to this as well, though, is more than just thinking of oneself, but it's also about releasing old strategies, old defending strategies, the ways in which one used to manage shame and um, those defensive ways of being. After the work of Calcinatio and specifically, um, more specifically, Salutio and the attending to the vessel, um, those strategies are needed less and less and the person comes to um, be able to release them more and more. And we can think about that as something uh, that, that some, uh, in, in a way, we can think about that and frame that as, as in terms of something is dying off. Um, and here in this image, you have death feeding, um, you know, pouring poison into the mouths of these individuals who are then, um, who are then uh, going to die so that something new can emerge. Then finally, coagulatio. Um, this is the um, sort of what we can think of as, as the kind of like the action phase. This is where um, in, in alchemy, coagulatio is the process by which liquid is turned into solid. And psychologically, it represents the process of integrating the previous work into a way of being in the world. So this is where it kind of culminates. Um, integrating what was previously outcast. So integrating those emotions, integrating those needs, integrating those wants and desires and finding ways to express them and live them so that they can be a part of one's narrative of who one's is, who, of who one is. Um, and related to this too, I think is also kind of hold, then holding compassion for oneself in this larger sort of frame. Finding worthiness in relationship, I see this also as a part of the coagulatio process. Um, you know, with, you know, complexes, you know, from a Jungian perspective, complexes don't ever go away, but their influence can be diminished over time. And so when someone is able to, someone is able to kind of adopt more of a sense of worthiness and how they see themselves, the story of shame lessens over time through this alchemical work. Um... So the, the metaphor I sometimes use is it's like the story of shame goes from being like a snarling Rottweiler to being more like a teacup poodle kind of nipping at your ankles. It's a very different experience. Um, and so uh, coming to sort of see oneself as worthy and in particular to see oneself as worthy in relationship. So I've gone over time a little bit here and I do apologize for that. I just want to share with you my references um, and just to offer my sincerest thank you to all of you for having a listen. Hope you've uh, enjoyed this. Hope you were able to kind of take some elements away that are useful to you. Thanks so much.